Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired software engineer going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today, I'm going to cover everything that you need to know to get set up and coding in C++ on the ESP32 microcontroller. But why the ESP32? Well, it's a chip that's really growing on me. I've been hacking on and with the ESP32 for about three years now, and its combination of fast performance, abundant memory, dual CPU cores, plus having Bluetooth and Wi-Fi built in has made it a lot of fun. A great deal of what you see in the background of my videos is actually run by ESP32s, such as the atomic fire lamp over my right shoulder, the flickering candle, the animated palm tree, and even the background windows themselves. They're all connected over Wi-Fi and receive their color information from a central server. But more than being just powerful and flexible, I actually find ESP32 programming to be a lot of fun. It's actually my hobby. When combined with VS Code and Platform I.O., which I'll show you how to do right away, the dev test debug cycle is quick and easy. You can get source level line by line debugging of your live application and it can make use of it all using the latest C17 magic because there are almost no other dependencies to worry about. You get a chip, a compiler, and an SDK to play with. Like a lot of folks, I was initially drawn to microcontroller programming by the ease of use promised by the Arduino lineup. It's a whole family of easy to use microcontrollers with a simple programming SDK. But the Arduino is more than 12 years old now. And when people say Arduino, what they usually mean is the ATmega 328P, the chip used in the Arduino Uno board. As I said, the ESP32 is not an Arduino. It's actually a much more powerful, professional-grade microcontroller with many more features. But here's the great part. They've ported the Arduino SDK to it so that you can use the chip with all the same ease that you would encounter in the Arduino line, but while simultaneously reaping the power and performance benefits of the ESP32. Let's take a quick look at the specs of the ESP32. I'll also include some of the Arduino Uno specs for comparison. Whereas the Arduino is a single core 8-bit chip, the ESP32 has two completely independent 32-bit cores each at a relatively blistering 240 MHz. How fast is that? Well, does that help if I say that's about 500 times faster than a PDP-11? Probably not. Maybe think back to your Pentium Pro 200 desktop days. That's roughly where its stack ranks in terms of performance, coming in at 600 million instructions per second. Not bad for $3, which seems to be the going rate on AliExpress. I know that on my Music Spectrum Analyzer project, it's enough to receive a packet of data over Wi-Fi, unpack it with LZ Compress, and run a full fast Fourier transform before displaying the results on a 1000 LED matrix using pulse width modulation. And it can do that 40 times per second, which blew my mind when I first attempted it. The ESP32 supports five different power modes like active, light sleep, and hibernation where it can wait while drawing a scant two microamps. That's one five hundredth of a milliamp, which is to say pretty close to nothing. The ESP32 has up to 18 12-bit analog to digital inputs and two 8-bit digital analog outputs. It has 10 capacitive sensor inputs for touch screens and the like. It also has four SPI bus connections, two I to C bus connections, and two I to S bus connections. SPI and I2C are great for connecting peripherals like sensors and LCD screens, and I2S is a standard for pushing PCM music around in a circuit. The ESP32 also contains an ultra-low power analog preamp. There are three UARTs for serial ports, and it can act as an SD card controller. The ESP32 can send IR remote control codes on up to eight channels at once. Those channels can also be used for driving other digital waveform communications, such as controlling eight channels of addressable LEDs in parallel. I use this ability to run the four arms of the atomic fire lamp and the eight spokes of the Tiki fire umbrella. The module itself contains a Hall effect sensor which can be used to detect the presence of a magnetic field. So, for example, you could use it as a sensor in a security system or even automotive fuel injection system. It also supports multiple internal real-time clocks. And because the chips all support Wi-Fi, all of my projects tend to set their own clock using the SNTP protocol to fetch the time from a time server at Google or similar. As you might have guessed by now, when combined, there's actually more functions than there are actual pins, and that's because pin assignment is often dynamic. So some features, like the DAX, are constrained to a narrow range of pins, whereas others, like the pulse width modulation for LEDs, can be almost on any pin. You simply say, for example, that LED channel 0 is on pin 5, or the serial UART is on pins 10 and 11, and so on. Naturally, however, you can't enable every feature on the chip all at once just because there aren't enough pins. That said, I've never run out or wanted for more with the two dozen or so that are available. There are also some odd constraints that result from how the chip's internal resources are managed, such as one of the DACs being unavailable while Wi-Fi is in use, but they are few and far between. Otherwise, the chip is very flexible and quite orthogonal. 
The chip actually ships from Espressif in one of two formats, a chip module with a PCB antenna or a chip module with a coaxial connector for an external antenna. Normally, however, you wouldn't use the module directly, at least as a hobbyist. Instead, you would order an ESP32 development board that houses the module in a standard little dip package of some sort. Let's have a look at the various form factors that are available now. First we have the most basic of modules which just has a power regulator, antenna and all your pinouts available from the module. Next we have a board that features the coaxial connector so you can run an external antenna. Following that we have the Heltec board with an onboard blue TFT screen. Following that we have a basic module again with just an antenna and a power supply but this time in a more longitudinal package that will fit better in a breadboard. The larger red Olamex board features an onboard Ethernet NIC so that you don't have to be reliant on Wi-Fi at all times. Next to that we find the TTGO board which has a nice built-in TFT display. Coming up after that we see an ESP32 rover, actually two of them, three of them in a row, all identifiable by the longer chip module package. The rover is known for supporting PS RAM and can ship with 4 or 8 megabytes of additional RAM right on the chip module. Now this is actually a board module stuck into a breakout board that gives me individual screw terminal access to each one of the output pins and I find it really handy for prototyping. And finally an Arduino Uno form factor so you can take advantage of some shields that you might have on hand already. Now it doesn't matter how great the chip is if the development environment sucks. There are certain things that I just hate working on like trying to build a responsive web user interface in the browser talking to a REST API on a server somewhere. It's just a nightmare to debug end to end and it makes it like actual work for me. The ESP32 dev environment is excellent however and I'm not talking about Eclipse, the official one from Espressif. Oh I I'm sure it's excellent and it has many fans. You can also use the Arduino IDE itself if you add the necessary board support files but we're going to go one better. We'll be using Visual Studio Code which is becoming the editor of choice for much of the programming world it seems. I'm going to quickly run through how to install Visual Studio Code and then the platform IO extension that we need. Installing Visual Studio is actually pretty straightforward so I'm going to run through it really quickly just so you see all the steps that I've gone through to set up my dev machine. So it's not that you need to see Visual Studio Code installed but I want to at least fast forward through the steps so that you don't have a machine and then go but what's missing from my machine? So as long as I go through all the steps necessary you should be fine as long as you follow along. So we're going to go and download it. I am running Windows. Now you have the choice of user installer or system installer. And I would say that if you have the rights to do so on your machine, get the system installer and lean towards 64-bit. Should start the download. There, it's already complete. I think it's important here that you pick add to path so that you get it added to your command line path and that will allow you to launch projects from the command line. That's it, it'll now launch when we finish setup. So this is my machine with, I've got a couple extensions installed but I do not yet have platform IO installed and that's the one you need. So let's go install that one together. I'm going to type in platform IO. That will find it and I just click install. 319 milliseconds. I'm a busy man and that's pretty good. So that's all it took to install and if I'm correct. Now we can just click on the little platform IO alien dude here or bug. I guess it's probably an ant. I'm not sure what he is actually. And that will get us to this little tool, toolbar quick access menu for platform IO from where we can pick PIO home and we'll say open that. It'll just get us to the home of platform IO. Good place to start. Let's write our first app. But what does that even mean when there's no keyboard, no mouse, and no display? Well, all we want to do for this first attempt is to compile, link, upload, and then run our program. We'll turn on the serial port monitor in platform IO. Our app will print hello world to the serial port, and if all goes well, we'll get our text displayed back in the IDE. Stay with it though, as our next step will be to add a sexy high-res TFT display, but we need to walk before we can run. From here, our most obvious action is new project, so let's do that. We'll give it a name, my first test, and we're going to pick an ESP32 module to tell Platform IO what it is we're going to build for. Now the thing is, sometimes you may not know exactly what you have, so you may not get a pin definition for the built-in LED and things like that if you don't use one specific to your board, but you will get all the general ESP32 support by just using Espressive ESP32 dev module, so I'm going to use that. I'll type in ESP32. Scroll down a bit, Espressif ESP32 dev module. 
No, I'm going to build with the Arduino framework or the SDK because that's what we're doing today. But you could also build the Espressive framework uh, using the one from the manufacturer and use that as well. So you can go back and forth. I never have really found a, a strong need to. There are some edge cases where you might need the manufacturer's latest and greatest, but so far they've got everything like PS RAM and support for everything that I need in the Arduino framework version. It'll take a couple seconds to chew away and create the project. Oh, it's already done. There we go. I'm going to stop this in case it's, it's bothering anybody here. Woo, there we go. It will create the folders for you. There's an include and lib. They, these will be empty. Source will have your main.cpp. All the VS code settings are automatically set up for you by Platform IO, so you don't generally have to worry about them. And all of your project settings are in a file in the root called platformio.ini. That's the file that's been up on the screen here, and they're pretty straightforward. At its most basic, it's saying that the environment that we're going to use is ESP32 dev. Platform is Espresso 32. The board is, again, ESP32 dev, and the framework is Arduino, the things we picked in our setup. So we could have typed them manually, and I often do, or just copy and paste. Because the wizard, or whatever it was, when we went through the new project menu, all it's doing is cranking out the folder structure and the platform I.O. So if you can create that on your own, great. If not, the wizard will do it for you. I'm now going to plug in my dev module. Let's build it by picking platform I.O. We could just jump right to upload, but that's one thing at a time. We'll say run build task. It's running away in the bottom window here, and it's done. It took five seconds, which is not bad for a first ever clean build on the machine, I would say. Now, I'm going to upload it, and I'm not going to tell it where to upload. It'll try to figure it out. If it doesn't work, you can put upload underscore port equals and end like com3 in the platformio.ini if you need to. But if you don't have a bunch of other weird ESP32s plugged in, it'll probably find it. I even have a couple plugged in, but let's see if we can find this one. We'll do upload. It finds it on COM17. It writes, and there you go. It's uploading now. It's already done. It's at a million baud, and you can actually do 1.5 million. But you can see your dev cycles are pretty quick. Five second builds, two second uploads. You're not waiting around for minutes. Plus, you can do it over Wi-Fi, and that's for a later episode. But you can do the flash over Wi-Fi, so you don't even have to plug it in. Let's look at the source code to whatever it is we just uploaded. That'll be in main.cpp. And it's completely blank. It does nothing. But it is the template that you need to start with that has two functions, setup and loop. Those are the only two functions you have to provide. You can include Arduino.h, makes things a lot simpler. And once you've done that, setup is called when the chip boots, and then loop is called repeatedly forever. So you put your one-time setup code in setup, and you're running loop code in loop, and you get it from there, I'm sure. Could it be that simple? And yes, it is. Let's try it. Let's upload. Okay, it's successfully uploaded. I'm going to do open in the serial monitor. Serial monitor. And we'll tell it to column 17. Clearly the wrong speed. So this is where we go into platform IO and we say monitor speed. 115, 200, because that's what I put in the serial init. It's probably defaults to 9600, but why, why stay that slow? Let's close the serial monitor. If I reopen it, is that sufficient? No. If I have to trash it. There we go. Access denied. If that happens, as it just did to me, I'm going to unplug and replug the device back in. Okay, there we are. Hello world, repeatedly. Because I put it in the loop part of the function. Uh, that's probably not the wisest thing to do, but I mean, it'll be gated by how fast serial is or isn't, so. Okay, now that we can walk, let's try running a little bit. I'm going to set aside the ultra basic ESP32 dev module we just used to take advantage of something called the M56C+. It's a self-contained module featuring the ESP32 at its heart, on top of which it adds a nice LCD screen, a microphone, real-time calendar clock, a couple of buttons, a three-axis IMU for tracking movement, and even a battery for unplugged operation. You get it all for about $19.95 to $25, depending on availability, and links to the M5 are in the video description. It even comes with an awesome watch strap so you can wear it on your wrist. I guarantee you'll be the only person in Virgin Atlantic First Class wearing one. There's a whole lineup of products, including the M5 stack, which has models that feature additional memory, a larger display, a bigger battery, and so on. You can buy many add-on sensors for everything from sound and light to volatile gas and time of flight. 
The range of things you can sense and control with the M5 line is quite impressive. You won't get bored for lack of variety anyway. Let's take a really quick look at the M5 site. Alright, so here I am at m5stack.com to kind of walk you through what their offerings are. So they have these bigger units which are stackable, and they even have a Lego plug that's on the back, but uh, as you can see, one passes through to the next with these pinwheels, and you can stack functional modules together for customized assembly. Don't know how deep you can go, but I don't know if there's a limit or not. You can also see they have external modules like this little uh, sensor here that plugs into the port. And you can get little plug-in ones that go into the M5 stick. That's this uh, orange unit right here, and that's the one that we're going to be using. So as you can see, they have quite a range. Here's the one I generally buy, because it cracks me up that you can wear it as a watch, but if you don't need that, I think they're like $19.99. Uh, so here's the one that's $22.99. Is it in stock? It's in stock. They have five in stock. Buy now. If you're watching this video live, buy now now. Looks like the ESP32 basic one is uh, out of stock, but it is available on Amazon. But it's 25 on Amazon when they're out of stock. So Now, in terms of sensors, Environmental hat, ambient light sensor, encoder units, thermocouples. Thermocouple? Wow. Uh, little PoE port, that's kind of cute. I think that's for the bigger one though. Uh, M5 stick C hat, ambient light sensor. Thermal printer kit, well that's cute. Now this goes on for pages, so. Heart rate monitor, thermal camera units, all kinds of stuff. It's kind of low res looking, but uh, neat anyway. And so that's just a quick little look at some of the offerings from M5 Stack. Again, not a sponsored video. I just want to show you what's up there because they're really easy to work with, the actual devices. So I recommend them because they've got all the stuff you want built in, like a microphone and a screen and all that stuff. The big thing that I'm going to do differently now that we have an LCD screen, of course, is to display text directly on the screen so that we can see what's going on and start to make more interesting apps. All we have to do is include the right header and lib and then add about five lines of code. We simply need to initialize the display, set the rotation, clear the screen, set our color, and start drawing. It sounds easy, and it is, so let's get right to it. Now to take advantage of the display, first we have to include a library, and this will be our first example of doing that. You can do it manually by including a line in platformio.any, you'll see the line that results at the end, but we'll use the UI to do it initially. We'll go to platformio, libraries, we're going to search for TFT. ESPI. This is the one we want. Let's see if that comes up with anything. Yep, Bodmer. This is indeed the one we want. So we click on it, and then we say add to project. Which project? We're going to add it to my first test. It has a single line libdeps and the one library that it is adding a reference to. That could even be just as simple as a GitHub address, and that would work too to add a properly formed GitHub project to your ESP32 project. So if somebody has code like this, in this case it's coming from GitHub as well, it uh, is it's something you can link to directly by simply putting it in your any file. No magic, no downloading of the code yourself behind the scenes and putting it in a folder and all that. Now there is a bit of magic that I have to include here and I got it from the documentation, so it's not really magic. It doesn't count if it's in the docs, but we need all the pinouts and everything for how the screen is actually connected to the ESP32 so that the library knows how to address the screen. After all, it could be wired to any of the pins, right? So, I've got all that information here. I've got the driver to use, the width, the height, the uh, CSDC, the reset pin, the MOSI, the clock, everything I could possibly want to know. I'm just defining as defines passed to the compiler and the TFT ESPI library knows how to make use of these. But all you need to do is copy and paste. And of course, I'll put this code up on GitHub somewhere so that you can follow along easily or just download it if you want to make sure you've got the exact copy of what we did during the episode. All right, so we've linked with this library, but we haven't done anything. First, let's include the library's header. We're going to declare an instance of the TFT ESPI class. Now, it, we're not going to tell it anything about what pins to use or anything because it's going to get that all from the defines we passed to the compiler. And so in the actual code, we just simply create one and it will do the right thing. Now you can see I had trouble uploading here, and experience has taught me when in doubt, slow the upload speed down a bit because I think it defaults to a million and that's a little too fast sometimes. 
Could be my cable, could be my port, could be the fact it's going through the keyboard, I have no idea. It could be USB 2 at this point. There, it's uploading now. Cool, and it displays Hello World, exactly as I wanted it to. The code is really simple. Now that I know that it works, I'll tell you what I did. Serial begin was there before, of course, for us to be able to initialize and use a serial port. Then we initialized the display. We set its rotation to three, which is one or three will work. If you want a portrait mode, then it'll be two or four, or zero or two, I guess, actually. We fill the screen with blue, and it gives you a color definition which works with that one, because otherwise you'd have to tell the RGB, and this is a uh, little faster shortcut. We also set the text color to be white in the foreground and blue in the background. We set the text size to be three, which is actually just triples the size of the base font. And then we print Hello World. That's your basic Hello World in C++ on an ESP32 featuring an LCD display. Not bad for 20 minutes, about a dozen lines of some pretty straightforward C code. One of the things I love about the ESP32 environment is that it's a little bit old school and that there's not a lot of voodoo. Other than the one project any file, there's no meta files, no preprocessors, no magic runtimes that need to be installed. You can certainly get away with knowing a lot less, but in case you're curious, here's the basic lay of the land. There's a little real-time multitasking operating system running on the chip called FreeRTOS. It's not Unix, but it's Unix-like in the way that it supports sockets, files, and so on. RTOS provides you the ability to create threads or tasks and to manage the memory heap and all the other basic functions in the C runtime that you'd expect from an operating system. Between the C runtime, the Arduino SDK, and the RTOS layer, odds are that the feature you need is in there somewhere. Next time, we'll look at adding a small web server to the chip so that we can connect to it over Wi-Fi via the web browser. I really appreciate you joining me out here in the shop today. If you're not already subscribed to the channel, I'd be honored if you consider subscribing, and if you found this episode some combination of entertaining and informative, please give it a like. If you have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please check out my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's got nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum. It's everything I know now that I wish I'd known back then. Remember, I'm just in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.